Uh, uh, and, and this was, I think, to the early Christians, I think almost uh, like an inside joke that they got and nobody else in the world got. And that was this. You can throw us to lions. You can, you can persecute us. You can take away our livelihoods. You can you cannot come to our places of business anymore uh, so that we are left uh, in poverty. But in the end, in the end, we have a God where we can't lose. The worst thing that you can do to us is kill us. And God has turned that around through the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that even if you kill us, we're not dead <laughs> yet. I have a T-shirt that my daughter bought for me. Being a Monty Python fan, most of you know where I'm going with this, right? It's the I'm not dead yet T-shirt. And, and so it's, uh, it's from, the, she got it in New York, Spamalot, okay, the Monty Python deal. There's a line in there where an old guy who looks dead says, I'm not dead. And so that's the way it was with Christians, with early Christians. They, you can kill them, but they understood I'm not dead. In fact, now I'm more alive than ever. Paul said, for me to, to, me to live on, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. So even the worst thing that we can think of that could happen to us in this earth, turns out God has turned it all around. He's turned the tables. Therefore... When we understand grace, we learned in, a, in the first message from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and following, that generosity begins with an understanding of grace. If it's coming from any place else, it's probably coming from a motive, or it's probably coming from an understanding that we have that we're somehow helping God out, and that poor God, he can't make it unless I throw in my ten bucks, Right? That's not the kind of giving that the, the Bible is talking about. It is born from grace. We understand. We understand how much we owed God spiritually. I mean, it's the, it's the parable that Jesus gave of the, of, the, of, the, of the servant who owed his master this incredible debt that he could never pay back. And so he went and pleaded with his master, begged him, look, I can't pay it back. Please, please have mercy. And the master had mercy on him. And then, of course, you know what happened? The servant, same servant, went out and he found a guy that owed him five bucks. And you know what he did? Proceeded to beat the tar out of the guy until he paid him the five bucks, right? That guy did not understand grace. He did not understand how much he had been forgiven and his master was not amused by that and neither is God when we don't understand grace, when we go out there and operate as if God has not been gracious to us. And so grace... Grace follows through with generosity. And then last week, we saw that, that when we give, the body of Christ is interdependent. You are, we are in the United States, we're fat cells for the body of Christ throughout the rest of the world, right? That means God has greatly blessed us with a lot of material things in this country. And if you don't believe that, I just go someplace else for two days and, and see how much you have. Even the poorest of us have more than, more than most of the world. We're the fat cells for the body of Christ. We should, we should be fulfilling that part of what we're supposed to do. The body of Christ is interdependent. It's, it's based on love. But also, when we give, Paul was very careful that we give intelligently, that we understand that when money is involved and we give gifts, there needs to be, has to be, and in Christian circles should be, proper accountability and openness and transparency with how money is handled. And so he went way out of his way to make sure that the Corinthians knew, look, I'm sending, I'm sending Titus, who is part of my organization, but I'm also sending two other guys who have nothing to do with the Apostle Paul Evangelistic Association. And they're going to make sure that the money that you give gets to Jerusalem where it's supposed to go. And so there is proper accountability. Don't ever give if you don't know that's going on. Because your gifts, I think, are, are wasted, or they end up in somebody's gold doghouse, okay? So make sure that the organization you're giving to uh, understands that. Now, in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, um, chapter, chapter 19, there's a, a, the story of the rich young man. You know the story. He came to Jesus, and, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, well, just follow the Ten, you know, do everything you're supposed to do, follow the Ten Commandments, do, do all that. And the guy said, well, I've done all of that since, my, since I was an infant. What more is there? And then Jesus, you know what he said to him? Well, go sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, come follow me. And that, the guy could not do it. Said he, all of a sudden, he was crest. You know, remember the word, the word crestfallen? He was crestfallen. And he walked away sorrowful. What the, the irony about that is the very first commandment is what? 
Okay, don't have, love, love God is, is another, but don't have, I am the Lord your God, do not have any other gods before me. And Jesus zeroed in on this guy's idol. His idol was apparently money. Our idols can be any number of things. And so this guy, even though he said, I've, I've obeyed all these since my youth, <laughs> the very first one, he wasn't. He had a God bigger than God. And he went away crestfallen. And Jesus made the statement, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were absolutely shocked. And the reason they were shocked is because of all the people on this earth, rich people were thought by the Jewish community at that time to have the blessings of God because they were rich. He had made them rich. He had their blessings from God. And here Jesus was turning the table saying, this gets, it's almost impossible. And then so the disciples said, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, this whole incident apparently jogged Peter's mind. And all of a sudden, he started thinking, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And he says it to Jesus. We, we've left everything to follow you. What then will we have? In other words... What's in it for me? Right? What's in it for me? Now, the shocking thing about that is that Jesus didn't tell him, shame on you, Peter. He actually told him what was in it for them. He said, guess what? In the kingdom of heaven, you're gonna, there's going to be 12 thrones, and you guys are going to be sitting on them. And... And if you give up anything in this, in this life, I'm going to give you back more than you've given up, basically. That's what he's saying. So in other words, I think God understands that about us. And yet he turns the tables. And we're going to understand when we're done with this that, yeah, God, there's plenty of it. There's plenty in this for us. But when we truly understand grace, that question is going to come up less and less with us. So here's the passage as we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 starting at verse 6. There had been uh, more verses we didn't read, but starting at verse 6, and it says this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work as it is written he has distributed freely he has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for these words of encouragement from your word. Help us to take them in and not just understand them with our head, but Lord, the whole point of this is, is for us as receivers of your grace to fully understand it, to enjoy it, and then, Lord, to have that well up in our, in our lives so that what comes out of us, what overflows from us, is great generosity in all things, not just money. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. In this passage, here's the point, if you don't get anything else. Paul teaches the Corinthians three benefits of generosity. So you're going to have to listen because the three benefits are coming up. I didn't list them there. All right, so you've got to listen. So here we go. What are the benefits? What are the benefits? 
What's in it for me? What's in it for you? Here we go. First point is this. God returns blessing to the giver. God returns blessing to the giver. Here's the point in verse 6, chapter 8. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, Paul's first point here is, is just a well known analogy from farming and it's and it's it's common sense it's self-evident in other words if you're farming if you're a farmer and you're going to go plant seed and especially in that day where they were less precise with with the you know jesus the parable of the sower and seed so you're planting seed to be the opposite of what jesus is saying here be like a farmer and saying to yourself what's the least amount that i can plant and still make the, have a harvest big enough Right? What's the least amount? What Jesus, what Paul is saying is what Jesus was also saying. That farmer is a fool. Because the seed for next year, guess where it comes from? The harvest. So if you're going to be miserly in how you plant your seeds, you're going to next year end up, oh my goodness, I don't have enough seed this year. Because you failed to plant bountifully last year. Now the word bountifully here. It, it, it's literally, it's the word blessing. It's upon blessing. So literally it would be, it would be saying that if you, that, that if you sow, if you sow uh, upon blessing, then you will reap upon blessing. That's literally what, what that says, and bountifully is, is a good way to say it. Um, it means that no farmer, as I just said, considers sowing at a loss, they don't consider, and here's the deal, they don't consider the seed they plant in the ground as wasted seed. As, oh my goodness, I, I'm, I'm losing all my seed, right? I can't, I can't plant that, I won't have it anymore. Well, yeah, you won't have it in seed form, but you will have it in crop form. And so the, the principle that Paul is is saying is that is that giving is generosity is like that it's 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 like seed and if you're thinking of anything you give as oh my goodness i'm gonna i don't have it anymore well it's true you won't you won't have whatever it is you gave but the principle and this is a principle of script principle of life that generosity in essence and sooner or later comes back to you it's, it's a principle of, of planting and harvest. That's just the way it works. Uh, in, in, in Proverbs chapter 11, it says this, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. Now the question is, what kind of blessings are promised here? What, what's the stuff of the principle of blessing here? What's the currency? Is it, you know, we get a lot of money back? Is it, what, is, what do we get back? Okay, what's, what's, what's the principle that's going on here? Well, I, there's, there's three things that I can see in this passage and others. Okay, the, what we get back, first of all, and foremost, is God's affirmation. Frankly, hopefully we can stop there. There's going to be more, but God's affirmation. In Proverbs 19, 17, it says this, One who is gracious to a poor man lends, lends, L-E-N-D-S, to the Lord. That's shock. Is that not shocking? That's shocking to me. When I first, I remember when I first encountered that verse, I, oh, it almost took my breath away. It's saying that God will put himself in a position to owe me. Holy cow. That's incredible. He owes me nothing. But he's saying, if I'm gracious to the poor man, it's like lending money to him. Wow. That's, that's him talking, not me. We see in this passage that God, what does he do with a cheerful giver? What's the word in this passage? Loves. God loves. A cheerful giver. Again, more on that later, but the, the generosity is a way of pleasing God. We, we receive the affirmation from God through the generosity that, that, that we practice. In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven and judgment, and, and, and it's the sheep and goat passages, and so he's got the sheep on one side, the good guy. He's got goats on the other side, the bad guys, and what does he say? 
Jesus says, Then the king will say to those on his right, the, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed into my, uh, by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Generosity receives the blessing of God. Now, don't misunderstand that passage, because as we study more, it's not, it's not a matter of do this, do this good stuff and you earn heaven. That's, that's not the point of that passage. The point of that passage is that those, again, who understand grace and who understand God do these kinds of things, and that receives the affirmation of God. Giving first, so the first, the first piece of currency we get by our generosity is just the blessing of God. The other harvest, the other currency uh, and gen that, that generosity collects and harvest is, now listen, is continued material blessing to enable more generosity. Now notice I didn't stop at continued material blessing, period. Because that's not what the passage teaches. The passage teaches that there's continued material blessing for an end, and the end is so that you can keep being generous at all times. Here's what it says in verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. There's that word grace again. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Now, reluctance to plant generously in all, it really reflects a refusal to trust a God who is all-sufficient and who is gracious to you. It also assumes that we can only give when we are prospering and, and we have something a little bit left over to give and, and we won't need it for ourselves, so it's okay. I can give it away because it's extra. And, and that's not the way the principle is working here either. Paul says that at all times, God provides us with all we need so there is never any time where we cannot be generous. Now, some of the examples in Scripture of this are, are not examples of somebody who has incredible wealth and they're tipping God with it. You know, yeah, that is. Here, here's, here's a fiver. Don't spend it all in one place, right? Here, here God, you know, do this. Here, Luke 6, verse 37 and 38, Jesus speaking. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive, you will be forgiven. Give, it's in that same passage where there's something happening, happening as a result of the action. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, that's the principle that Jesus was describing. Get, okay, don't, ju don't judge, and nobody's going to, you know, be judging you. They'll understand that your character is a little bit above that. You know, the, uh, forgive people, and guess what? Guess what? You will get forgiveness. Give, and it'll be given to you. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, there is a, a passage about a widow. And Elijah, and it was during the drought, is when Elijah said, there's not going to be any rain. And so God said, Elijah, I want you to go to this widow over here, and I've prepared her to meet your needs. And here's how the passage reads in 1 Kings chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, saying, Arise, uh, go to um, Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, so that's to the north of, of Israel along the coast, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, that, that is shocking right there in the passage. Why? Well, because widows... If their husband had died, they, they don't, unless somebody is taking care of them, they're the poorest in the community. In fact, the Old Testament and the New says, it has very clear instruction, take care of widows. They don't have anybody else to take care of them. 
And so God says to Elijah, I'm going to meet your needs through a widow. Oh, well, thanks, God. So you're going to send me to somebody who's got nothing already, and they're going to provide my needs. So, so there, there's where he goes. So he arose and went uh, to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called out to her, Oh, by the way, sound guys, you'll appreciate that. Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Give me something to eat, too. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and your son. Oh, thank you. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. Now, if you're the woman, what are you going to do? Here's this guy dressed in weird clothes, unshaven, completely looking whacked out. Oh, God wants you to take the only flour and oil you have left, and he wants you to make me some bread because I'm hungry. What would you do? Go pound sand, Elijah. There's plenty of it around. Because it hasn't rained. We know what that's like here. You see the principle here, though? Whoo. Ah. Uh, get, give God first. Even when you think you can't do it. That was the principle. And that is, I think, one of the hardest things to do because that involves taking something that's very real like money and saying, okay, God, here you go. And I don't know. I'm going to give you first. Several things are going on here. And I hope you notice that. The widow was not rich. And she was not going to get rich out of this. Right? She's going to the promise to her is you're going to have enough. God's going to make sure. You're not going to die. Like you thought you were going to. Now, also get this. If God hadn't happened, if Elijah hadn't come on the scene, she was going to die. She was going to die. That was the last thing she had. And God now was going to be merciful and have that extended. She was asked to trust God and to take a risk. And, and folks, I don't care how, what the amount is you give. Every time I think we give, for whatever reason, because money is such a tangible thing, we think we're releasing something, we think we're going to lose it, it's never going to come back to us. Thin air. God provided not only for her, <laughs> but also for Elijah and her son. That's what God is willing to do. That's what he's willing to do when we practice generosity. Remember the first week of the series, and I, I, I mentioned it again, that, uh, uh, that we're fat cells. Remember the kid, the video I showed the first week, the kid who gave his baseball? Yes, those, of you who were, those of you who were here and saw that little video, kid at a baseball game, gets a baseball, and look, if you've never been a kid at a baseball game, at a major league game, and gotten a baseball, you have no understanding of the value of that thing. Uh, that's, that's like the most value. I'll tell you what, if I'd have got a baseball like that as a kid, as a 10-year-old kid, 11-year-old kid at a baseball game, especially a Dodger game, and I, you know, I got the foul ball, it's mine! Right? And I don't care who would have been crying around me. Too bad! <laughs> I caught it! If you'd brought your glove, you could have a ball, but no. It's mine. I'll tell you what. I, can you? But the kid, he saw the other kid who was so disappointed, and he gave him the baseball. What happened? Cameras happened to be on him. And the announcers were going crazy. Look at this kid. I can't believe this kid's a hero. And they brought him up to the press box. Not only did he get a ball, but he got a bat. You never get bats at baseball games unless somebody loses one and you have to take a pounding on the head first and then you get the bat. 
That's amazing. That's the kind of generosity. Of, and that's, that's the currency that God is saying, I'm going to give back. When you, when you do this, the promise is you will have enough to continue your lifestyle of generosity. God's going to make sure. Why? Well, because he can trust you with it. You've, in a sense, proven that you understand God's grace and, and you can be generous. So that's the currency. He, he blesses you material so that you can keep on giving. That, I, that's not my word. That's, that's right there. I hope you can see it. Thirdly, the currency of the harvest is the prayers of others. And this is something, again, you know, oh, very nice, very nice. Yes, others pray for me. Oh, great. Just, you can stop the material. You can stop with the money, all right? Oh, I'll be very pleased with that. I don't know about you, but I can take all the prayers from others that I can get. At the very end of this passage, verse 14, it says, While they, they the ones who have received your generosity, long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. That, that's, that's overlooked, I think, in this passage. What Paul is saying, you not only... You not only get the affirmation of God, you not only get material stuff so that you can keep being generous, but now other people are going to pray for you because of your generosity. My mom and dad prayed for me every day of their life. I know that. My dad's been gone uh, seven years, almost eight years now. My mom has been gone four years. I'm, I'm hoping they can still pray for me in heaven. I think they can. But, but I'll tell you what, I know that there are, there are things that, that have probably I've been, I've been delivered from or saved from or, or been able to do just simply because people were praying for me. I'll bet it's true of you too, and you won't see that stuff until you get to heaven. And when, when you finally get to see behind the curtain, you will be saying, oh my God. And I mean mean, oh my God, thank you. Right? Prayers, the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous person does much. Second point is this. God's approval, and we've already said this, we're going to elaborate. God's approval rests on the carefree giver. Verse, uh, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, this is very personal. Paul says that we must give what we have decided and this means that we're supposed to give it some thought. It's not supposed to, every time we give, just be an emotional response. Oh, I'm so they're starving. Okay, that's, that may be okay every now and then, and we should be moved emotionally, or I mean, or we're not human beings, right? But what Paul is saying here is that, look, I want you, I want you to give it some thought. I want this to be part of your thinking part of your thought processes, and as you think about it, that means you're probably going to pray about it, and as you pray about it, God is probably going to speak to your heart, and therefore, once that happens, you can make a decision. Decide, purpose, in your heart, what it's going to be. It's very personal. Have you prayed? Have you sought out God? This, it, it's not a, it, 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 so you're not, so you're free of the pressure from people like me or other people who get up and try to, try to coerce you into giving more, all right? That, that's a very bad reason for giving. It should be coming from the Lord. Of course, we should be responsive to others, but, but if it's, if it's going to be forever an emotional response, guess what? What happens when the emotion isn't there anymore? The thrill is gone, right? Therefore, if the thrill's gone, I don't need to give. Oh, we got, well, our whole bodies need to be connected to this. Our mind, our emotion, our will. So, so Paul says, make a decision. The verb, must give, is implied. It's not even stated on here. It's not there in the Greek. Literally, this reads something like Yoda would say, each one, just as decided, in his heart, must. <laughs> right? Something like that. And the verbs are all tangled up in the wrong place. That's the way it works. So decide, because God loves a, a cheerful giver. Cheerful. Smiles, everyone, right? <laughs> Welcome to fantasy. So, all right. Cheerful. Cheerful is the first word of that sentence. Again, it's a Yoda thing. Cheerful, you must be. All right, so Cheerful. It's in, a, it's in a place of emphasis in, in the sentence. And, and so here's the catch-22 with this. God loves a cheerful giver, 
But we cannot be the kind of cheerful that God loves without first receiving grace. If we don't understand grace, we will not be the kind of cheerful giver that's talked about here. Grace is always connected to it. Now, I'm sure you've heard the Greek word here that we translate cheerful is the word hilarion, from which we get the word hilarious, right? Giving should be fun. I, you know, I don't think, I really think that giving should be fun. There should be, there should be the sense of joy behind it, even if you, you know, I, I'm so, I can give this one dollar. People in the rest of the world, they might give the dollar, but it's going to break him. It's not breaking me. I can give this dollar. Woo! All right, uh, the, I, uh, grace does that. It, 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 it brings along the kind of cheerfulness that, 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 God, that God loves. And, and in fact, it, I think it's even more than that. It's not, the Macedonians were giving cheerfully, but, but there's, in, early on in chapter 8, in that example, it goes beyond cheerful. What Paul was saying in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is that the Macedonians were begging for the chance to give. There was a, there was a sense, I've got to do this. Not only am I going to be cheerful about it, I have to do it. There was a sense, there was a sense of, of needing to. Now, let, let me give you kind of how this works sometimes. Women, how many, well, this is a very personal question. So you don't have to raise your hand. But those of you who breastfed your babies, understand how this works. All right? If you're breastfeeding a baby, you love to do it. At least the women that I've been around, they are breastfeeding their babies. They seem to be enjoying it. Except for when the baby bites, and they're not enjoying it quite so much. But there's a joy to it. Now, here's the principle at work. Here's how it works. They're enjoying it, but there's also a sense, I've got to feed this baby right now. Why? <laughs> Things are getting heavy. I've got to feed this baby right now. So there's a sense of, I need to do this. Now, do you see how, that, that is, do you see how God does this? He attaches our giving to need. That's amazing. Why? Because it's like him. We're made in his image. We're made with a need to give. And, and therefore, when we understand grace, it's not a sense of obligation. Now, even though it is, we need to, but we can do it with joy. In Proverbs 22, 9, it says, Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. I love that phrase, bountiful eye. It means that you're a person who's looking to be generous in every way. So let's get back to the beginning. If, you, if you're wondering what's in this for you and you seem to be one who God has passed by in his blessing, let me ask you a question. What were you expecting when you gave? Were you expecting immediate riches thrown in your lap? Were, were you, it's probably not the attitude of the, the sort of cheerful giver that God is talking about here. That attitude says, okay, let me get this over with so that the money will start coming in. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I, we're, we're promised this, but, but, but in a sense, if, it's not about that. It's a principle that God has woven into generosity. But it is not, and I repeat, not because of Elijah and because of a get-rich-quick scheme. And if we take it that way, and if we're listening to others who are telling us that it's a get rich, you know, it's a way to get rich, then the people I see in Scripture and the people I've known in my life, some of them have great wealth, but not most of them. But everyone has what they need. And everyone can give a testimony of how God provided when, when the chips were down. I know that to be true. Last point is this. True generosity exalts God. Verses 12 and 13. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints,
but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all the others. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift is the second passage there. Now in the end, generosity is not about us and what we receive. Generosity is about, as everything in our lives as a believer is, about God. It's about, it's about him. It's about his grace that overflows in our lives and produces generosity. Then the people who are the receivers of, our genera- of that kind of, of carefree generosity, they learn something about God and they praise him. God meets their needs through you. They understand that they can't pay back the gift, and that's the whole point. When you give to God, when you give anything, generosity, what Scripture is saying is that God has your back. Remember the verse from Proverbs, He who is generous to a poor man lends to the Lord. So, if you feel any disappointment with God this morning, let me ask you this. Who are you trying to exalt? Yourself or God? I mentioned last week, and I mentioned the week before this, and I'll mention it again this week. This church, I would put this church up against any church in the United States for understanding generosity. I I would. Any church. I have nothing but praise and gratitude for this church for the way you give, for the way you give sacrificially. And last week I, I, I rattled the statistics off to you and it blows my mind. So the encouragement here is excel even more and understand that when we give, God is glorified. It's not about us or how good we give or how we stack up with churches in the United States. By the way, I would take a little higher scale than that. Generally speaking, now here's the way it worked in their day. In, in Paul's society, in Greco-Roman society, generosity toward the poor out of compassion for them and their state was not considered even a virtuous act. In fact, you were considered kind of foolish if you gave to somebody who couldn't repay you. In fact, the whole point of giving in that culture was that so you get a monument built about you at some point which said how great a person you are to give this to this city or, or that or whatever else. Generosity to the poor came through Jewish circles through Christians and into the present day. And now it's highly valued even in our culture. Perhaps you view God in one of the following ways. You view God as a poor guy, as a guy as a guy too poor to take care of people without you. Oh, poor God, he needs my money again here. I assure you, I assure you that that's not how this works. Do you feel that God is a cosmic beggar who shouldn't need what you have to get things done? Why should I give to God? Doesn't he have enough money? Someone who will make sure that people notice what you do so that people will praise and love you. Is that your motivation? You know, let's be honest, all too often that's... infected by that to a certain degree and that's why we need God's grace because every time we recognize that poison we are then able to confess it and have God heal it so that we can give carefree the band comes up here's what I want you to remember in the end in the end what's in it for us is the grace listen because I know I just told the band to move, and so you're, you're thinking about the band moving, and you're thinking about this thing being done, all right? So just listen for just another minute. In the end, what's in it for us is the grace to no longer have to ask, what's in it for me? Experience with God tells us that we don't need to worry about that. Generosity 
always brings God's blessings, material and spiritual blessings to us. We will have enough because we serve a God who is himself a hilarious giver and who sees and takes note of every act of generosity. It's, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme, and like the widow who gave to Elijah, you might even be poor. But God always rewards those who trust him in some way. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is possible at some times, nearly possible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who diligently seek him. Our giving perhaps beyond all other things we might do, is our declaration, not just to the world, but to ourselves. It's our declaration that we believe God exists and we believe he's got our back. Let's declare that to him today in every way we can. Ushers are going to come forward as we do the last song here. We're giving to the benevolent need for Irene and beyond, hopefully. Uh, this is not intended to be an emotional <laughs> deal to get you to do more of that more right now. We already had it planned. But that's what we're going to do right now. Here's the next step as we close it. Does your current level of giving reflect trust in God's love for you? Do you believe his promises to bless you and exalt himself through your generosity? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for some of these promises of your word that, quite frankly, sometimes we, we, they're too good to be true. And yet I know, because I've seen it myself in my own life, and I've seen it big time in other people's lives, that those, those who have settled this issue of trust with you are able to be incredibly generous because they're not seeing it as a loss. They're seeing it as a way of planting and harvesting. Things are coming back into their lives that, that they never guessed would come just through being generous. So Lord, plant within us that seed of generosity that will grow and overflow in our lives. Help us to understand that this is all because of your grace, that each one of us is indebted to you to, to the level we could never repay, and you came and did something for us and forgave us our debt. Therefore, we can afford to be generous. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. As we sing, the ushers will go ahead and come.